Well, you guys, we're launching into a new series, a mini series here on the Holy Spirit. And over the next two weeks, as we do kind of the ramp up to Easter, I'm so excited to look at the third person or the third part of the Trinity. We're going to be looking this week at who the Holy Spirit is. And then next week, we're going to look at what the Holy Spirit does and what we can do in response. And so uh, you say, Pastor Scott, why would you uh, do this series? Why would you launch into this two-part series about the Holy Spirit? Well, that's a great question. Um, a part of it is I just have continued to felt, uh, feel that God is prompting me personally to talk about the foundational parts of our faith. Uh, I talked uh, last week to close out our last series about grace and truth and John 1.14. And just as I was pr praying and preparing, I uh, just really felt stirred to talk about the Holy Spirit. And so just as a foundational piece of our faith that I think we understand somewhat, but I think there's a lot more for us to lean into. And it's very interesting because a lot of different streams of Christianity talk about the Holy Spirit in different ways. Some streams uh, talk about the Holy Spirit so much that it almost seems like all they do is talk about the Holy Spirit and they emphasize the Holy Spirit and experiencing the Holy Spirit. And then there's other streams of Christianity that are almost fearful to talk about the Holy Spirit. Maybe for whatever reason, there's a, uh, a concern about kind of emotionalism or, or the, the, the experiential part, uh, the, the potential dangers of that. And so they almost just, uh, uh, as Francis Chan would say, the forgotten God, that just the part of the Trinity that we just don't talk about. And so uh, what do we do with that? What do we do with the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? And uh, so that's part of it, just, just the foundational piece of our faith. But another part of it, you guys, is that we have uh, continued to uh, emphasize for us as a church that we want to be a church that is a word and spirit church, that we are a church that is uh, passionate about God's word. It is a, it, the Bible is authoritative to our life, that we believe it's the inspired word of God, that it gives us direction and counsel for life. Um, also, so we want, we want to emphasize the word. We also want to emphasize the spirit, that God's spirit is available to us, that God is personal, that he interacts with us, and, and uh, we can experience his spirit, that his spirit is still living and active and doing miracles, and we believe that. And so we want to be a church that is a word church and a spirit church, a church where the spirit of God flows to the banks of scripture. So that's another reason. A third reason is, is that whenever you look at, uh, in the Bible, whenever there is trial or challenge, uh, what you'll see often is you'll see an emphasis on the Holy Spirit, because that is God's empowering uh, for the for believers, for his disciples, for his followers. And so as you look at the book of Acts, and then as you continue to follow Paul's writing into the New Testament, what we see is that they're, uh, whenever they have a, a something, they, when they don't know what to do, whenever they're kind of down and out, you see the Holy Spirit show up. And so I even feel like for us as a people, for Element Church, you know, as we've just kind of come out, coming out of these last couple years, and again, it's not over. It's not like, you know, all of that is done, uh, done with. As we are confronting challenges, it's the Holy Spirit uh, being more important, I believe, than ever before. Not, not that the Holy Spirit's more important because the Holy Spirit's always been as important as he is, but just maybe our sense or understanding of how much we need the Holy Spirit. And so that's another reason why I feel like this mini series is really, really important. So again, what I'm going to do is over the next two weeks, I'm going to talk about who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, and what we can do in response. And I actually, uh, last thing before we jump into God's word is I actually spoke at a church uh, uh, that's in the network that we're a part of down in Indiana, and I had the opportunity to speak on some of this. And so again, that kind of prompted me as well, um, just to, to bring it back to our family. And we even had some of the folks in our church that said, hey, would you would you kind of talk about that? Would you would you bring that back to us and, and share a little bit about that? So those are the reasons why we're diving into the Holy Spirit over the next two weeks, in addition uh, to allowing God to just speak through us as we get into the Easter season. So let me pray over us, and then let me just jump right into our teaching for this morning. So Father, thank you for this morning. God, I pray that you would move in a powerful way this morning, that you would speak to our hearts. God, we make a confession that we're open and we're listening. God, would you come and do your work in us? Would you come change us? God, thank you that an encounter with your word and an encounter with your spirit is an encounter with life change. So come and do your work in us, God. We, uh, we confess that we're open, listening, that we need you, that we're desperate for you. And so God, we ask you to come and do your work in us this morning as you speak to us out of your word. Well, great, you guys. Well, I wanted to start out with a story, an analogy. As you know, we're here at Michigan State University in East Lansing. And um, years ago, actually in 1982, on October 16th, there was a football game that was played between the Michigan State Spartans and the Wisconsin Badgers. That actually happened to be at Camp Randall uh, there in Wisconsin not here at Michigan State, but the Spartans had traveled up to Wisconsin. They were playing in front of a, 
uh, a, a, a huge crowd, 78,187 people in attendance that day. And something interesting was happening is um, Wisconsin and Michigan State were battling back and forth. Um, Michigan State was actually at several points driving down the field to score. So basically, for those non-football people, Wisconsin was losing at certain points in the game. Michigan State was winning. But what would happen is as Michigan State was winning in the football game, the crowd of 78,187 would begin to cheer. And, uh, and actually, they interviewed the coach later, uh, Muddy Waters, who was the coach for Michigan State in 1982. He said, I couldn't figure out why they were cheering while we were marching down uh, into their red zone to score a touchdown. Basically, again, moving toward a score in a position where Wisconsin was actually losing. Muddy Waters said, I, I, I couldn't figure out why they were doing that the entire game. We'd be whooping the, the, the daylights out of them, and their fans were actually cheering. And what was unbeknownst to Muddy Waters and many other people in the stadium on the field that day is that uh, 79 miles away, the Milwaukee Brewers were actually rallying back against the St. Louis Cardinals in game four of the Baseball World Series. And uh, that's a game that they would actually win seven to five. And so back in those days, a lot of people had in-ear radios. And so while there was people sitting watching the Wisconsin-Michigan State football game, they actually were responding to something that they were hearing not what they were seeing. And it's really an interesting thing because a crowd of 78,187 could sit in a stadium and watch their team lose and yet be cheering for a team that was winning. And there were two realities that were playing out simultaneously. And um, I know that it's not a perfect analogy, but they were hearing something and experiencing something different than what they were seeing. And in a very similar way, uh, not a perfect analogy, but I think uh, paints a parallel for us. I believe that um, we can be celebrating victory in the presence of obvious uh, challenge in front of us. We can actually be hearing something, a reality that's true, that's different than the reality that's in front of us. And in a very um, obvious way, hopefully for us at this point in this analogy, I believe that God can be speaking to us about the truth while we're watching a different truth happen in front of us and that there are two realities playing out simultaneously. And there's so many losing narratives right now. There's so many, if you will, stay with the analogy, so many football games that we're watching that just look like, man, we're just losing the game. And yet at the same time, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit is actually with us and God is whispering into our ears. And I just wanted to ask the question this morning of us and is what if there was a mechanism, a way in which God would ensure that his reality would be playing in our ears no matter what we were seeing on the field in front of us? And I believe that there is, and I believe that that is the Holy Spirit. I believe God still does that, and I believe that God speaks to us uh, through prayer. I believe God speaks through us uh, to us through multiple situations, but that through God's Spirit, he's actually speaking to us about the realities that are true in heaven— that actually do have bearing on our life here while we watch the things that are happening, the political, the economic, the uh, the war in Eastern Europe, the coming out of COVID, all of these things that we're watching in front of us. And so, um, you know, I believe that God does talk to us. I believe, uh, I've never heard God's voice audibly, but I believe that God does speak in the sense of that radio, that frequency that's in our ears, that's in our hearts. And um, when God, when someone talks to God, we say, oh, they're praying. But when, when someone says, oh, God talks to me, we think that they're crazy or that they're weird. But really, prayer is a two-way conversation. And I really, again, do believe that God speaks with us. I didn't always believe this, however, and you may actually even be listening to this today. And no matter where you're at on your spiritual journey, there may be varying degrees of this, but you may be questioning whether God really speaks anymore. And I, I just want to validate uh, that. I, I felt that way at one point in my life, too. I remember when I was 19 years old, I was actually uh, dating Pastor Erica. We are obviously not married at the time. And uh, I remember being at her house and it was um, it, it was dark out. It wasn't super late, but it was an evening. And I remember being out in her front yard and they had a trampoline. And I remember we were actually both just laying on a trampoline, kind of talking, looking up at the stars. And and uh, I remember her telling me I, you know, about her day. She was telling me about her day and she said something to me. She said, oh, well, a couple of days ago, I lost a necklace and I couldn't find it. And I looked everywhere and she was like, and then today I thought about it. And I was like, why don't I pray about it? And she's like, so I talked to God and I asked him to help me find it. And she, and then she said, and I don't remember if she pulled it out of her pocket or she pointed to her, 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 her neck area or whatever, but she pointed and, and she had her necklace and she said, I believe that God helped me find it. And I remember talking to her and I said, I'm not sure that God does that. 
And I was, I was very, very uh, serious and very honest. I said, I said, frankly, I'm not sure that God cares about your necklace. And uh, what I've come to find out is that God does care about our necklaces, that God cares about the little details in our life, that God actively is speaking in our ears no matter what we're seeing. And we can't ever let what we see counteract what we're hearing. And the entire New Testament is actually full of God speaking and leading and urging and assisting and directing uh, his children. And the, some people think that he just suddenly stopped. But I have a question for you. If you are a parent and you have children, or even if you have a friend or if you have a spouse, would you just, someone you cared about, would you just stop speaking to them? Of course not. You would, uh, as a parent, you would continue to speak to your kids. Dallas Willard actually said this. Dallas Willard said, if God doesn't speak today, then the greatest disservice we could ever do to people is to tell them that they could have a personal relationship with God. And so I believe that God established this mechanism for us, you guys, to have hope and freedom and peace and satisfaction and purpose and pleasure and power and all the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, and also the gifts of the Spirit, uh, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophecy, uh, the ability, I would say the ability to forgive our enemies. All of these things come as a mechanism of the Holy Spirit. So how do we stay in tune with the Holy Spirit? We're going to be talking about that more next week. And again, this week, what I'd like to do is talk about um, who the Holy Spirit is. So um, who is the Holy Spirit? I've got a couple points for us today. If you're taking notes, make sure that you get your wrists ready to write. And then if you're not taking notes, you can actually download them right from our phone app. You can go download the phone app if you don't have it. Go to the media section, pull up today's teaching, scroll down, and you'll see a little notes tab. You can click that and get the PDF with all of today's scriptures and all of today's notes on it. So four points for us today. Who is the Holy Spirit? Number one, um, the Holy Spirit is a person, not a thing. The Holy Spirit's a person, not a thing. And sometimes we think about the Holy Spirit, we say the Holy Spirit as if the Spirit is something that is uh, impersonal, like a like a life force or something like that. And part of the reason why we actually uh, maybe think that way is some of the words that the Bible uses for the Spirit. In Hebrew, the word is ruach, which literally means wind or breath. But it actually goes beyond wind or breath. It goes into like the essence or energy of life. So if you stop and you're listening to this, just stop for just a moment and just breathe in deep. That's wind, right? That's breath. But what happens is when you breathe in deep, it's not just breath. There's like a vitality that you can sense and feel in your body. It's like, a, it's like an energy. It's a breath. It's a... Um, that's the idea in the, in the Hebrew word of Ruach. And the Bible in Genesis actually says, in Genesis 1-2, it says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God, the Ruach, the life essence, the, the deep breath, that, that vitality and energy of God was hovering over the waters. That God's Spirit was present to do the creative work that God was speaking out of his mouth. Um, in the Greek, the word is pneuma. It's a current of air or a blast of breath, a strong breeze. And you can read all about that in Acts 1.8. It says that we'll receive power from the Holy Spirit when he comes on us. That spirit is that wind, that breath. And so sometimes we think of those things, that essence, that spirit, that breath as something impersonal, but it's a mistake to think that the Holy Spirit is impersonal. He's actually a person. And in John 14, 7, Jesus is talking and he says this, he said, the world cannot accept him the Holy Spirit, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives in you. Do you want me to read that again? Watch how many personal, um, how many, uh, how much personal language is here from the, the mouth of Jesus. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives in you. So the Holy Numa, the breath of God, the spirit of God is actually referred to as a he, um, uh, one time and him four times. He's not a force or an essence. He's not like the Star Wars force or um, let the force be with you, but he is a person. And when someone is a person, we get to know them personally. And this actually starts to really open up our theology about God's spirit because God's spirit is the God that we can know personally. It's not a thing or an essence. He is a person. Number two today is this, is that the Holy Spirit's not weird. So who's the Holy Spirit? Number one, the Holy Spirit is a, is a, a person, not a thing. Number two, the Holy Spirit is not weird. And again, I referenced earlier that some streams of Christianity are hesitant really to talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is mysterious because 
We don't fully understand everything that God does, all that God is. So a, a holy, perfect, all-powerful God is always going to be, a, in a sense, mysterious to a fallible human like me or like you. Um, but just because we don't understand all that God does, and some of those things can be mysterious or even can feel odd sometimes, um, the Holy Spirit's not weird. Now, as I referenced before, the Spirit of uh, God, this, the river of the Spirit flows to the banks of Scripture. So we understand that the Scripture actually gives bumper rails, if you will, over what the Holy Spirit does. And so that gives us some comfort and ability to understand the Holy Spirit. But we also understand that we actually need beyond the Bible. We, we need God's Spirit, not just the Bible. You say, well, that sounds interesting, Pastor Scott. Isn't the Bible enough? Well, the Bible is incredible. The Bible is the authoritative Word of God, right? Here's the thing, though. There's a lot of things that you're going to face in your life that are not prescriptively outlined in the Bible. Where you should go to school, what job you should take, who you should marry. I could go on and on and on, but there's a lot of things that we need the Spirit of God to speak to us that isn't prescriptively outlined in the Bible. Um, there's other things that I could bring like that, but we need the Bible and we need God's Spirit. That's why I said we are a church that highlights both God's Word and God's Spirit. The river of the Spirit flows through the banks of Scripture. So the Holy Spirit isn't weird. The Holy Spirit operates within the confines or the context of God's Word. John 16, 13, Jesus says this. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, that's the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all the truth. And then I love this. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. So here's the deal. God's spirit is speaking what he hears from Jesus and the father. So there's this like Trinity thing that's happening, which we're going to touch base on more in just a moment. But the Holy Spirit, the river of the Spirit, flows within the banks of Scripture. And in another portion of the Scripture, um, uh, Jesus says that it's actually better for him to leave and to go away and to send the Holy Spirit back to us as Jesus's followers. Now, this is really interesting because Jesus said, look, it's better for you that I go away and send the Holy Spirit back. And I know this, Jesus is awesome. So there's no way that Jesus is going to say, hey, it's better for you, for me to leave and then send back like my weird cousin. That doesn't happen, right? Jesus says, it's better for you that I go and I'm going to send back my spirit, God's spirit. I'm going to send back the helper, the comforter uh, back to you. And it is going to be better for you. So we know that the Holy Spirit is not weird. Now, this is interesting because there's, um, there is a charismatic God and then there's a charismatic culture. Charisma has to do with the Greek word charis, which means divine empowerment or divine grace, um, uh, divine support, divine empowerment. So there is a charismatic God. There's a God whose spirit is fueling us with divine empowerment. But then there's a charismatic culture. And charismatic culture can be weird. A charismatic God is not weird, but charismatic people can be sometimes weird. There's things that the Holy Spirit does, and then there's things that people do in the name of the Holy Spirit. So God is not weird. A charismatic God's not weird. Sometimes charismatic culture can be weird. People can be weird, but the Holy Spirit is not weird. In 1 Corinthians 14, 32 through 33, it says, The spirit of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Here's the thing. The Holy Spirit doesn't take us over and make us do things that are out of control. The Bible says that actually that the Holy Spirit comes in and partners with us and that the spirit of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. Now, that doesn't mean we control God, but it means that we can control ourselves when the Holy Spirit comes in. Now, of course, maybe you've been in some charismatic meetings where there are people that uh, submit themselves to the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've seen people fall over in the Spirit. Maybe you've seen some things like that. Those are people surrendering to the Spirit. That's not the Spirit taking over their body where they can't control things anymore. So we understand this is that there's charismatic culture and then there's a charismatic God, a divine empowering God. Um, God is not weird. The Holy Spirit's not weird. Charismatic people can do weird things in God's name. So who's the Holy Spirit? Number one, the Holy Spirit is personal. He's a person, not a thing. And then secondarily, the Holy Spirit's not weird. So who's the Holy Spirit? Number three is this, is that the Holy Spirit is God. And this is fascinating because people think about God and they often think about in a Judeo-Christian context, at least, or even Islamic context, people think about God as a, um, uh, 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 I shouldn't throw the Islamic culture and as a whole different thing. I'll, I'll just, Judeo-Christian context is that God is um, a creator. He's an all-knowing creator. And then in the Christian context, he's a father. 
And this is very unique. Again, the Christian context is unique from the Islamic context or the Jewish context, that God is our father, that he's personal, that he's intimate. Um, people are comfortable, uh, Christian people are comfortable with God the father. And then Christian people are often comfortable with Jesus, the Son. But then a lot of people don't understand God, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. So I want to try to explain the Trinity, which again has uh, is, a, is a topic that's so deep that you could spend an entire lifetime and just scratch the surface. But let me give you my best uh, couple moments of trying to understand this in, in a, obviously an oversimplified way, but a way that I think is very, very helpful. At least it has been to me. Now, the Trinity, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but the Trinity means that there are there's one God. Uh, Orthodox Christianity says that there's one God in three persons or three essences. And there's some debate about what the, the word, should it be three persons, three essences? What word do you use there? But it's one God, not three gods, one God who is in three expressions or three persons. Okay, so here's why this is so important. Or here's how this works. There has to, here's the uniqueness about the Trinity and why it boggles our minds. There has to be two-way equality. Let me say it like that. So what that means is this, that it's one God in three expressions, but each of those expressions actually is fully God in and of themselves because they're not three different entities. It's God. So let me say it like this. Some people will try to explain the Trinity through analogy and they'll say something like, well, the Trinity is like an egg. There's like a yolk and there's a white and there's a shell. Now that that is one way uh, to explain the Trinity because it's one thing that is found in three different expressions. It's an egg that's found in a shell, a yolk, and a white. The problem is that it, it doesn't then work back the other way in equality. An egg shell is not an egg. An egg yolk is not an egg. And an egg white is not an egg. So you, you don't have the fullness of an egg in any of the three parts. And so there's not two-way equality. So what you have to figure out, um, uh, well, let me give you one other quick analogy. Some people will say, hey, Pastor Scott, it's like, uh, or, or I, I would say to do the analogy, it's like me, and then I have three different hats that I wear or three different roles. I'm, I am a pastor, and I am a husband, and I am a father. So it's me in every scenario, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm expressing myself in three different ways. And again, that works one direction because it's one me expressed in three directions. The problem is me as a pastor or me as a husband or me as a father is not the totality of who I am. And so it doesn't work back the other way. So this is the best analogy that I have heard that I can come up with to really try to get an understanding of this is just a, a basic thing that you probably learned about in middle school science class, which is H2O which is water. H2O is the molecular structure of water. And here's what's very interesting is that H2O is actually a thing, right? It's one thing, H2O, but it actually can be expressed in three different ways. H2O can be expressed when you heat it up as steam, when you cool it down as ice, or when you let it in its natural state flow as water. So H2O can actually be expressed in three different uh, essences or three different formats. However, each of those formats is fully H2O. If you take uh, water, it's H2O. If you take ice and you you thought it's, it's, it's ice is H2O. If you take steam, it's H2O. And so the molecular structure is consistent and the fullness of H2O is found in steam, uh, ice, and water. And yet, uh, so, so it works both ways. It, H2O in three different uh, configurations and also each of the configurations is fully H2O in and of itself. And this is the idea of the Trinity. And even beyond that, you can actually study something that you probably didn't learn about in your middle school science class, although maybe some of you did. It's called triple, triple point. You can study this on your own time. But triple point is actually uh, a point in which when you take temperature and pressure, you can put H2O in a certain temperature and pressure where it actually exists in all three formats simultaneously. Now, that's fascinating to me and super cool, and I just think like God hides like little Easter eggs for us, but I think triple point is a great analogy of the Trinity because it's H2O as steam, ice, and water all in the same moment, and we can see how H2O is one thing expressed in three different essences, but each of the three essences can be simultaneously at the same time in triple point one thing, and yet also three different expressions that all have the totality of H2O in and of themselves. Now that's how I like to think about the Trinity. And here's how we understand the Trinity. God, the father 
is in heaven. He's the creator of all things. He's our father. Jesus is the son who is God manifest in the flesh to come and to pay for our sin, to actually restore us back into relationship with God himself. And then Jesus leaves in bodily form and sends back God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, who again is, wasn't like birthed or something, right? Um, he, he, uh, Jesus was begotten of the father and the Holy Spirit was there in uh, the beginning chapter of Genesis in the, in the first book of the Bible. So we understand that that's the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So um, who is the Holy Spirit? He's not a thing. He's a person. He's not weird. And he's God. He's God. The Holy Spirit is God. And then uh, point number four, and I'll close with this um, this morning, is that the Holy Spirit is God. You say, Pastor Scott, that's the same point. No, living in us. The Holy Spirit is God living in us. Now, this is fascinating theologically and fascinating practically and fascinating experientially because God's Spirit, uh, the, the third part of the Trinity, is God's Spirit available to dwell in us. Now, that still, after uh, decades of walking with God, still boggles my mind. Okay, let me show you a little bit about this. As I said, in the beginning of, of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, okay, it says that God is in heaven and the, the earth is formless and void. And it says that the spirit of God is hovering over the face of the deep. And God speaks, God the Father speaks a word and the spirit of God is on earth and actually makes the word happen. Actually, is the, the creative breath essence, um, the pneuma, the, the ruach that actually makes God's words manifest onto the earth. Now, this is really, really cool and really fascinating. Um, God's spirit is here from the very beginning. As we move forward into the Old Testament, what we see is that humans go their own way, and then God comes to make a temporary covenant with humanity until Jesus can come later. Um, but he, he makes a covenant with God's people, and then what ends up happening is that you have God's people operating on the earth, you have God the Father in heaven who has a, a covenant with them, and then God's Spirit shows up and visits humanity from time to time to empower them for certain things. Let me say it like this is that in the Old Testament, humans were visited by and visited God's spirit. So there was a, a, a visitation that went back and forth between God's spirit and humanity. Now, the, the first time we really see this um, explicitly is with Joseph. Joseph has, God gives Joseph the power to interpret dreams. We see it um, in uh, artisans and, and construction uh, folks who are building the temple in the Old Testament. And it says that God's spirit empowers them to do their, their, their craft skillfully. We see it in the prophets in the Old Testament. And what we see is that the spirit of God will show up and visit a human for a purpose and then actually depart. We'll also see that God's priests in the Old Testament actually will go into the temple and they will visit God's spirit in the Holy of Holies once a year. They'll go in behind this huge curtain. The high priest would go in once a year to atone for the people's sins and would have a visitation with God's spirit. We see Moses visiting with God's spirit at the tent of meeting. So we see that humans are visiting the spirit and that the, the spirit of God is visiting humans. Now this is really cool. Okay. And this happens typically in most of the old Testament in the temple. It's really, really cool, but also limited. And as you move forward, we see something start to happen in the person of Jesus that is absolutely fascinating. In the new Testament, Jesus shows up as God's son, as God manifests in the flesh. And Jesus uh, operates in a mysterious way. Jesus is, the Bible says, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but 100% God, this is how theologians frame it up, 100% God and 100% man. The Bible says that although Jesus was in uh, equality with God, in Philippians uh, 2, 6, and 7, I'll read it to you. Though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself of his, uh, of his divinity by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. So we know this, he was God in the flesh, and yet he limited his divinity uh, in order to operate in a unique way. And the way that Jesus operated was this, as a man, as a human man, under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. So he actually started a new pattern. Jesus operated as, um, in a very theological sense, to save us from our sins, he was 100% God. But in a very practical way, he operated as a human being 
op operating through, he laid down a portion of his divinity and operated instead through the power of God's spirit. Now, why is that important? Here's why it's important, because I can't be Jesus and you can't be Jesus because Jesus was God. But I can be a human being operating under the, the inspiration and the power of God's spirit. And that's actually exactly what Jesus was introducing us to, is that Jesus is actually establishing a new pattern of being a human being. He chose to operate as a man under the power and influence of God's spirit. Now, um, we know that in uh, in the beginning of the Gospels, we know that as Jesus was starting his ministry, if you go read it, it says that he was baptized in the River Jordan. And it says as he came out of the river, that God's spirit descended on him like a dove and came to rest on him and then never left. So you see in the Old Testament, we have God's spirit coming and visiting for a purpose for a season and then departing. But in Jesus, for the first time in human history, we have the Holy Spirit coming, descending and staying on someone for the first time. In Matthew 3, 16 and 17, it says, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And this is a new model for us. As I said, I am not God and I can't be God. I can't be Jesus, but I can be a human being whose spirit is resting, whose God's, who has God's spirit resting on them. And this is actually exactly what we see when Jesus says, it's better for you disciples that I go away because I'm going to send my spirit back to you. One of the first things we see Jesus do post-resurrection when he sees his disciples, it says he breathes on them and says, what? Receive the Holy Spirit. Later, before Jesus goes back to heaven, he says, hey, I'm sending you out. He gives us the great commission. And he says this, before you go try to do this, make sure you go to Jerusalem and wait until you are endued with power from on high. He says, I'm, I'm sending you on a mission, but don't go yet because you don't have the spirit yet that's staying with you. So go to Jerusalem and wait. And then what we see in the book of Acts, and I'll read it here in Acts 2, 1 through 4, it says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. By the way, if you go back, it says, John the Baptist says, I came to baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Really, really interesting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled just as Jesus came up and the Holy Spirit came and settled on him, says that they appeared and settled on each one of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them ability. And there we see it, you guys, is that it is God's Spirit actually indwelling or sitting on and staying with human beings for the first time. In 1 John 4, 17, it says, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Now we're not Jesus. We're not a hundred percent God, but we are like Jesus in the sense that we're human beings operating under the power of the Holy Spirit that comes and stays. Now, again, this is theologically, practically, and experientially explosive. Um, so much so that I think it's just hard for us to wrap our heads around sometimes. But who is the Holy Spirit? He's God who lives in us. Now, to close out this idea, I said in the Old Testament, they had temples where the priest, the high priest would go in and they would visit God's Spirit once a year in the Holy of Holies behind this huge curtain, and then they would leave back out. Um, in Matthew 27, 50 through 51, Jesus is on the cross, and it says, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. This is when Jesus is dying on the cross. And it says, at that, Matthew 27, 50 through 51, and at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, the earth shook, and the rocks split. Now, what happened right there? We know that in the temple, there was a place called the Holy of Holies. There was a huge curtain. Don't think of like a shower curtain. Think of like a, like a, a six inch thick curtain that's like 40 feet high, like this huge wall, like, like a retractable wall. And it says that it was, that's where the, the spirit of God was. It says it was split in two and literally torn open. What happened? The Holy Spirit, when Jesus dies on the cross to atone for humanity's sin, the Holy Spirit leaves the temple and will never go back to the Holy, Holies, uh, Holy of Holies again. Where did he go? Where does the Holy Spirit go? 
And I hope that by now you can figure out how this is working. But as the temple veil is torn, the Holy Spirit leaves the Old Testament temple and the Holy Spirit goes to dwell in the New Testament temple. Now you say, Pastor Scott, where is the New Te Testament temple? 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? 2 Corinthians 6.16, For we're the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. So who's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is not a thing. He's personal. And the Holy Spirit's not weird. And the Holy Spirit is God, the third part of the Trinity. And then the Holy Spirit is God living in us. And I believe you guys, as we understand who the Holy Spirit is, that we begin to start to live a new kind of life. Because if we are the kind of human beings that God's spirit indwells, that comes and settles on us and stays, then what that means is that no matter what we see, no matter what challenges we're watching in front of us, no matter what game is going, whether we're winning or losing, we know that God's spirit is in our ears and in our hearts, speaking God's truth and reality to us, no matter the situation. And this changes absolutely everything. So how would we stay in tune with God's spirit? Yes, we know the Bible. We're a word and spirit church. We know the Bible speaks to us, but we know that the Holy Spirit needs to live and dwell on the inside of us. And I will close with this scripture, Romans 8, 14. It says, for those who are led by the spirit of God, they are the children of God. And this morning, as we close and move into a time of worship, I just want to remind you that God cares about the necklaces in your life, that he cares about each and every little detail, that he's not a God who's far off somewhere, but that he's a God that is closer than your breath. The, the Ruach, the Numa, the deep breath that's within us, the energy that comes, the vitality that comes, that God's spirit literally dwells in us and that he's speaking victory. He's speaking hope. He's speaking life. He's speaking love. He's speaking joy. He's speaking all the fruit of the Spirit and all the gifts of the Spirit. And not only is he speaking it in our ears, but he's actually stirring it up in our heart and changing our lives. He's changing the, uh, the Spirit inside of us. He's changing the attitudes and the emotions. He's actually not only giving us revelation from the Bible, but he's actually giving us transformation in our souls. And so what I want to do this morning is pray over us that we would just ask the Holy Spirit for, uh, for a deeper leading, that we would give him permission to come and to lead us in a fresh way this morning. And so I'm going to pray uh, just a, a prayer of asking for the Holy Spirit. And then I'm going to pray over us just a receptive, a receptive prayer of the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. And so if that's you this morning and you're like, you know what, Pastor Scott, I, I want to say yes to the Holy Spirit. I know that even from our time this morning, Pastor Scott, that the Holy Spirit's inviting me to know more of him, to surrender more to him, that he's opening my eyes to see who he is and the fact that he's right here with me. And so today I want to say yes to him and I want to pray for you right where you are. So let's pray together. Even if you feel, you know, even if you want to open your hands, this is as a physical response that you're like, you're receiving something. Go ahead and open up your hands, wherever you are, um, in, your, in your room, in your dorm room, in your house, uh, you're a group of people, you're at a, a home watching this together, whatever it is, oh, go ahead and open your hands. Let me pray over you this morning. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Jesus, you said it was better for you to leave and to send your spirit back to us. So right now we stand on that truth and we stand on that promise. And God, I pray right now for everybody that can hear my voice. God, we are watching so many challenges in front of us. God, there's so many games that we're watching, so many back and forth where it just looks like it just looks like loss and defeat. It just looks like hopelessness and despair. And so God, I just pray in those situations right now for all those that have their hands open to receive from you. God, I pray a fresh voice into their hearts into their ears and into their hearts. God, I pray God right now as they've said yes to more of you. Let's just pray this guy say say um God I want more of you. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to come into my life, to lead me, to guide me, to speak a better word over me. I thank you for replacing my hopelessness with hope. I thank you for replacing my despair with your truth. God, right now, come in, Holy Spirit. I say yes to you. Come in and fill me up in a fresh way. Come in and stir me up in a fresh way. Come in and help me, transform me from the inside 
out. God, I ask you to come in to lead me in a fresh way. God, your word says that those that are led by your spirit are your children. So would you come and lead me in a fresh way as a son or a daughter? Would you come and lead me this morning? God, I ask for fresh gifts of the spirit. God, I ask for uh, wisdom and revelation. God, I pray for words of wisdom and words of knowledge. God, I pray for interpretation. God, I pray, God, that you would just give um, divine insight, God, into situations. God, wisdom beyond our years. God, I pray that you would help us think like you and see like you and speak like you. God, I pray that we would be able to encourage like you. I pray that you would fill us up with all the fruit of the Spirit. God, I pray for fresh love and fresh joy. God, not only in an academic sense, but in an experiential sense, God, would you transform our desires and our emotions from the inside out. Holy Spirit, as you dwell with us and you don't just visit and leave, but as you stay and transform, I pray, God, for love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. God, I pray that over every person within the sound of my voice. And God, we say yes again this morning to you. And we say yes to you, Holy Spirit. We want more. Come in and fill us up. Do your work. Transform us. Change us. And lead us and guide us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. And hey, just in a moment of prayer here, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, as we talked about this morning, God the Father loves you. He came in the in the person of Jesus. Jesus came. It says that Jesus was God's only begotten Son. That He was a hundred percent God and a hundred percent man. He was a unique uh, human being, that he came and lived a sinless life and he died on the cross to pay for your sin. That's the wrong things that you do. And that he came to open up the doorway back to relationship with God. And then he sent the Holy Spirit back to indwell you as you say yes to him. So this morning, if you've never said yes to Jesus, uh, the Bible says that if you will surrender your will, surrender your life to him and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be in charge. I don't want to run my own life anymore. I want you to be in charge my Lord and Savior, Jesus, I, I just confess to you that I'm a sinner and that I don't need to try harder and some sort of religious observation, but that I need you to come in and I need you to change me, to give me a new heart and to set me on a new path in my life. And so if you want to do that this morning, just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you came and paid for my sin on the cross. Thank you for everything you did for me. Right now, I confess out of my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are God. And I just confess out of my mouth that you're my Lord and you're my Savior. I surrender my life to you. I ask you to come in and to give me a new heart. I ask you to come in and to awaken my spirit. And God, I surrender my life to you. Thank you for who you are. And thank you that I can now live my life with you for the rest of eternity. Lastly, God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. As we've talked about today, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to indwell in me and live in me, to empower me, to bring comfort, to bring clarity. And I thank you, God, for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome, you guys. If you prayed that prayer, would you let us know? Text the keyword element to 97,000. We'd love to hear from you. And we would love to just celebrate. And I would love to even just pray for you in my own personal uh, quiet time with God. So we'd love to, uh, to get that form from you. If you text element to 97,000, fill out that form. On the form, there's a box that says, I made a decision for Jesus today. Would you click that box and let us know? Uh, we'd love to pray. Uh, with you in our own personal quiet times. And we would just love to hear from you. Also, make sure you get involved in a good Bible-believing church. We like this one. And so we invite you to join us here at Element. Guys, let's take this time and what the Lord has spoken to us this morning. Let's just continue to worship and let's give the Holy Spirit time to come in and speak. What's the one thing you heard today that the Holy Spirit wants to highlight? And then secondarily, what's the one thing you need to do this week because of what he's highlighting in you this morning? Let's go into a time of worship and let's listen for the Holy Spirit.